FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is March 29th, 2017. We're nine weeks in. What's the state of the Trump presidency? Here to discuss is former Congressman John LeBoutlier. John, it's been a while. Welcome back. Kerry, it has, and it's been too long a while, and I'm happy to be back with you on your wonderful show. How are you? Uh, great. Everything is good, and uh, well, I don't know about the State of the Union, but it's definitely interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Oh, yeah. There's a lot going on. <laughs> One of the more active uh, first uh, nine weeks. Um, I'm going to say 100 days would be seven into 100 is like what? Uh, 14 and a half, call it. Weeks. Yeah, so we're, I think we're at 60, <laughs> I don't know how many days we're in now. Um, Seems like forever. Right nine on. weeks last Wednesday, so we're, we're coming up on 70 days. Yeah, 70 days. So 70% of the first 100 days. So, you know, <laughs> uh, the topic that we could discuss would be, you know, taking a look at so far, where, where is Trump at? And I would say it's a mixed bag. You know, there's some some very good things. The uh, Gorsuch um, um, appointment to the Supreme Court, I give that an A+. Plus. I, I can't think any, any person could look at this guy and not say totally 1,000% qualified to be on the Supreme Court. And I think most of the cabinet picks have been dead on good picks. Mm -hmm. And I think the president should be commended for all that. Right. I don't think that it's been great in the, in the White House staff. I think the White House staff is, frankly, minor league. Uh, there's no heavyweight in there who really knows how government works and how the federal government especially works and can tell the president the things the president ought to hear, whether he likes them or not. Every president <laughs> needs to hear things that he may not want to hear, but he's got to hear it. And to have sycophants who just tell him what he wants to hear doesn't help any president. And they all all of them have these sycophants around them. I know. And they need they need a Jim Baker, a Leon Panetta, a sharp guy with experience who can say to the president, sir, with all due respect, this little tangent you're going on is a huge mistake. And I'm going to tell you why it's a mistake and mm -hmm. invoke some history, some precedent to show yeah. that this particular thing, for instance, the tweet, the tweet about Obama bugged uh, Trump Tower has been a huge negative carry for this president. It has diverted attention from the White House, from the legislative effort, has sent congressional committees on a wild goose chase. I'm sure in his heart of hearts, Donald Trump, if he could take that back without having to admit he was wrong, would take it back because it hasn't mm -hmm. helped him. It's hurt him. Mm -hmm. And he, sh he shouldn't be tweeting at 624 on a Saturday morning without staff being involved. In it. <laughs> and what a president says and tweets and writes is hugely important. Every word that comes from a president carries the weight of gold with it and must be treated that way. And Trump's a little cavalier with that Twitter finger, you know, and lately he's yeah. been a little more careful about it because I think yeah. he no knows that they got him into some trouble. Hey, when, when I met Trump, I did a couple of minor cases for him dealing with his casinos. That's always been my fear is that he's been surrounded with yes men. But uh, what I did notice is he, uh, what I thought I noticed during the campaign is that uh, he took guidance and, uh, and grew through the campaign. Because when one set of people wasn't working, they got replaced with a more effective set. And I think that's what you're going to see here, John, when he realizes it might take him a while to come to the conclusion that, hey, Reince Priebus, who I don't believe he could have gotten through the election without, because Priebus basically delivered Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin to him. Without him, he wouldn't have won. I'm convinced of it. So, but Priebus uh, is way out of his depth here as chief of staff. He's got to go. And uh, once that happens, and maybe he brings in Chris Christie and he's testing him out with his opioid abuse committee right now. I think it's a test run, but I think uh, he brings in the uh, adults and I think you'll you'll see a, a transition again take place. It's my guess. Well, it could be. 
Could be, all right, because he did three times in four months change the campaign staff. He in June he got rid of Lewandowski and right. brought Manafort totally to run the whole thing. It already had Manafort above Lewandowski, but yep. Lewandowski was running it. Gets mm-hmm. rid of him, puts Manafort in charge till August, and he gets rid of Manafort, brings in this triumvirate of Priebus, yeah. Bannon, and Kellyanne Conway. Yeah. And they took it all the way. And I, I, he did listen, especially the last 10 days of the campaign where he went on the teleprompter, stopped with the off-the-cuff comments, and stopped stepping all over his own message. Mm-hmm. And it worked, and he won. Now, as president, he's stepping all over his message all the time, and he needs to tighten it up. I think, and, yeah. You know, we had this unfortunate quote to Time Magazine the other day, which is, I quote, I must be doing something all right because I'm president and you're not. Uh, it was an Obama that, that paraphrase. Is, that's an, yeah, it's a George H.W. <laughs> Bush phrase. Of the first yeah. Bush, when yeah. he became president. And staff would come in and tell him not to do something. He'd say to them, if you're so smart, how come I'm president and you're not? Wrong answer. Wrong Wrong answer. answer And the wrong way of thinking. You should not be thinking that I'm smarter than my staff. No. Yeah, you're the boss. Surround yourself with people smarter than you is what you ought to do. That'll make you smarter. Not surround yourself with ass kissers who tell you what you want to hear. Hey, the world's full of those, John, we know it. But hey, looking at yep. his cabinet picks, uh, some of them are downright inspired. I think uh, Kelly, General Kelly for Homeland. I think Mattis. I mean, they're doing more there. They appear to be. And then you go down to uh, Mnuchin, seems to have a good grasp on things. Uh, these guys are, you know, they're go-getters. They, they know what they're doing. They appear to, to be in control. I mean, it remains to be seen but they seem to be a cohesive group. And uh, Rex Tillerson, I mean, we haven't had a secretary of state like him uh, since Baker. Uh, He seems to really be in charge, hits the ground running, and he cleaned house, cleaned out the seventh floor, uh, his third day in office, uh, the deep state there at the the State Department. I mean, that guy. So yeah, your team... On the one hand, he makes these inspired picks in the cabinet. On the other hand, I think he feels indebted to these people, a lot of the staff that's around him, and, and he's a person who does reward loyalty. Well, I don't mind having that uh, them be there, but they need other people besides them. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, running a campaign, which he basically ran anyway, is one thing. And um, running the White House and, and getting along with the government is a whole different deal. And he doesn't have anybody who's ever done it. Kellyanne, Priebus, Bannon, had never been in the government before. No, no. And he needs seasoned hand and he needs to listen to it. So that that's that. Now we get to policy. You know, and I think, I think he's tried really hard from day one with the executive orders to say to the people who voted for him, I haven't forgotten the promises I made to you. I'm going to try to keep them. To his credit, he's right from the get-go, he's tried to do it, both symbolically with um, the meetings with uh, you know auto companies and carrier and all that stuff to try to show that I'm going to keep jobs in America, I'm going to fix the economy up. That, that stuff's all good. Most of it was symbolic, but it was still good. He was trying to have people know, I'm not changing uh, now that I'm here in, in, in uh, Washington. That I commend him for. But then we get to the things that he screwed up, and and there's been a few of them. One was the executive order on the travel ban, which was a screw-up from the get-go. It was only eight days into the administration. I forgive them for that, but they rushed it. Mm -hmm. We all know in our lives when we rush things, we make mistakes. We screw up. And that first one was written by Jason Miller, the other departments weren't consulted properly. It was Mm -hmm. a fiasco of implementation. And of course, it was a fiasco uh, in the courts and was blocked by a George W. Bush federal judge, not a quote, so-called judge. This guy's a legit judge and he Mm -hmm. he stops it. That was a screw up. And the second travel ban, which was supposed to be better than the first one, he undercut that by announcing that basically my new travel ban is the same as the old travel ban. It's watered down. And I wish (laughs) we'd kept the old one going all the way. So that that was the whole thing with that travel ban and the federal courts has been mismanaged. 
Yes. And I'm sure he wasn't listening to his advisors on it. That's yeah. the problem. You put Sessions and in then charge comes- of that. Put Sessions in charge yeah. of it. Because he's the guy that's got to go to court and uh, and defend it and make it work. So have a lawyer do right. it. But I, I, I think if I remember back on it, Sessions hadn't been confirmed yet. So I know, but still. He, he still wasn't there. the attorney general. And they had, they had Sally Yates and all that stuff. And she, yeah. yes, that's right. She was the acting attorney general. And she refused to. Yeah, to protest enforce it. The, yeah. the ruling, so he fired her for that. But then we get to the major screw up, mm. and the only really big screw up so far. It's a major one. Is the whole health care thing, yeah. uh, which has been an utter disaster politically, totally, and continues to be. And last night, the president at an event at the White House was talking again about how easy it'll be to fix health care, and now we're going to do it with the Democrats. <laughs> well. No, you're not. And yeah. the Democrats, if you try to get the Democrats involved in health care, uh, most Republicans will back out mm-hmm. and the Democrats will insist on no repeal. Yeah. And the biggest the biggest single promise of the Republican Party over the last four election cycles, which was we're going to repeal it and replace it, will have been undercut by the president. He will be working with the Democrats who will refuse to repeal it. Yep. Yeah, they'll fix it. They'd like to fix it. Oh, there is but no fixing that's it. not what the Republicans ran on. Yeah. Yep. Well, they've boxed themselves into a corner. They can't get the votes together. So how did they get out of it, John? Uh, leave it alone. Forget about it and move on to something else. And I think that something else. Well, well, first, something else is coming, whether they like it or not. Yeah. And it is the trickiest thing of all. It's raising the debt ceiling by the mm-hmm. end of April. Right. And, and as you well know, you have to borrow money to run the federal government and you can't borrow any more when you've hit the debt ceiling until Correct. Congress raises the debt ceiling by another one to two trillion dollars for the next fiscal year. Mm-hmm. And here's the math. You got to have 218, it might be 216 because we have two vacancies in the, in the House. Mm hmm. Where are you going to get those votes in the House? Um, the Freedom Caucus won't vote for it, and especially now that Trump is trashing them all the time. Mm. Forget them. There's 40 House members who won't vote for it. There are a lot of other Republicans, carry who will never vote to raise the debt soon. They're conservative. They don't like that. They're not going to raise it. Mm-hmm. And in the past, what would happen is Democrats would participate in raising it. But they, I don't think they're going to work with Trump. I think they're going to sit off to the side and say, no, Hmm. you've got the House, the Senate, and the White House. You guys run the government. We're not a part of it. You go raise Hmm. uh, the debt ceiling. Yeah. And I'm not sure that there are 218 votes to do it, Kerry, and that this could be uh, a disaster for Republicans, that the government will run out of money. And who are the Republicans going to blame? They Hmm. run all three two branches of government. They, you can't, you can blame the Democrats, but it won't work. Well, what power do the Democrats have? Yeah. Yeah. But they have leverage on Trump. They could say, well, we'll give you some votes to raise the debt ceiling, but in order to do it, you're going to have to give us several things. You have Mm. to keep Obamacare. Right. Uh, you have to give us a trillion dollars for infrastructure. And you have to roll back these new environmental things you just put in. You got to get rid of that. We're not here to participate in in ruining the environment. So that stuff's got to go. I mean, they're going to stick it to him with the left wing agenda. And I'll tell you something. Mm -hmm. Trump would be amenable to a lot of it normally. He is not a conservative and he's not a Republican. Mm -hmm. He will be much happier working with Pelosi and Schumer than he is with Ryan and McConnell in the long run. That is no doubt in my mind. Whether he's ready to do it in the next month, I don't know. But he's headed in that direction. Mm-hmm. Well, he's tweeting out. He's trashing the Freedom Caucus every day in tweets. Mm-hmm. How smart is that? He, he needs their votes, and he's trashing them. Oh, the Freedom Caucus snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. No, mm-hmm. defeat, defeat from the jaws, from the of, jaws victory. of victory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But gotcha. he tweeted that out. He's blaming them. They couldn't stand victory, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Well, yeah. We will see. But what about the executive orders rolling back all these Obama mis- misguided, uh, ill-begotten Obama policies? 
Uh, and I think those have been, like I said, most of them are very good because he was trying to keep faith with his voters, which he promised to do. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of those executive orders are more symbolic than they are substantive. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, to fix the things that Obama screwed up, which are immigration, health care, all that, you've got to fix that through the legislative process. Yeah, of course. And we're off to a rocky start based on the health care thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well... Hey, we're only uh, 70 something days in, so a little too early, uh, you know, rumors of his death or demise are greatly exaggerated, right? Uh, you never know. Uh, definitely greatly exaggerated, but I will say this. If I, if I wanted to get snarky about it, <laughs> uh, I would say I, we were told 10 months ago, quote, only I can fix these problems. That was the yeah. exact quote. Only I can fix it was in his convention speech last summer. Only I can fix it. (laughs) Nobody knows more than I do about ISIS. Nobody knows more about hacking than I do. The Mm -hmm. arrogance of this guy on many things uh, (laughs) has put him in a rough position today and is only going to hurt him even more because it isn't only I can save it. That's not the way our system works. Thank God Mm -hmm. it has to be a we of a president and a house and a Senate in order to change things. And right now he's been fumbling that. Yeah. And nobody knows more. How about the quote two weeks ago? Oh, no one. I mean, we never knew how complicated health care was. Right. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I think we all knew exactly how complicated it was, except for him. Yeah. And he's now getting an on the job education. So I, I hope a lot of his supporters who thought this guy walks on water are beginning <laughs> to realize He's a human being like the rest of us. He makes mistakes like the rest of us. And in fact, he knows less about government and these issues than most of us do. You know, John, I'm And we're going to be sitting around here waiting for him to catch up. He'll catch up, but he'll do what he's got to do. I'm just reminded of a uh, Will Rogers quote when I was listening to you, when he said, uh, ignorance got us into this mess and ignorance will get us out. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Right? (laughs) He had a lot of uh, down-home spun uh, wisdom, old Will Rogers. So uh, by all uh, accounts, though, you know, look, Trump shouldn't be there by all accounts, by all odds. He was not going to win. And by all accounts, uh, he defied all odds. And so... Uh, you know, look, I don't have any great hopes because I've been through too many elections here, hoping that the next guy was going to do what the last guy couldn't. And you know what? They don't. It's never happened. Reagan was the closest we got, and he didn't get that much done. When you look at it in perspective, all he was able to do was step in front of the juggernaut and slow it down a little. So I take the promises with a grain. But, you know, uh, look, if he can cut back the EPA by a couple of, uh, you know, 20, 30 points and stop the regulatory juggernaut, you know, nobody's going to get everything they want here. Let's face it. Right. Nobody is going to be able to do that. Yeah. I, I, when I thinking what you just said, I will say this about Reagan. He didn't stop the federal growth juggernaut. You're absolutely right. It grew. It just didn't grow at as fast a rate under Reagan as it had under Carter and would again under Clinton and Obama. But the big accomplishment in the long run for Reagan was the he broke the back of the Soviet empire. And because of that, it has changed all our calculations in both foreign and domestic policy, because we we don't need to spend as much on the military as we did during the Cold War. Therefore, we have more money for social things. And look what's happened yeah. with that. We didn't have and enough. <laughs> never have enough. Yeah, never it's have enough. The government. Enough. But the it's government. a guns and butter argument. You know, you needed fewer yeah. guns and more butter after the Cold War ended. And politically, mm. the demise of the Soviet Union has caused huge trouble for the Republican Party. Because yeah. in the past, all wings of our party, left, center, and right, found common ground in standing up to communism, and it united the Republicans. There were libertarians, there were conservatives, there were moderates, but at first they were anti-communist, anti-Soviet people. Once the Soviets disappeared, that 
uniting bond was gone. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Tea Party and regular Republicans, they can both be called Republican, but they don't get along at all. They don't agree on anything, really. Uh, There is no Soviet Union to bring us together. So these people are all off the map. That's why Boehner failed as speaker. It's why Ryan is already in trouble as speaker. And you can get rid of Ryan and put Joe Blow in there. It's not going to change. These groups of Republicans have nothing in common. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is very true. And maybe perhaps why both parties are headed for doom. But that's a story for another day. We're just going to have to see the way this is going to shake out. Where do we find you these days, John? I'm doing a podcast every week called Revolution underscore the podcast, which you can find at SoundCloud or at my site, johnleboot.com, J-O-H-N-L-E-B-O-U-T.com. All right. Well, we will definitely feature your podcast on our site, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Got any questions about this interview or others we've done? Send me an email, kl at kerrylutz.com, kl at kerrylutz.com. John, we'll talk to you again real soon. Be well. I hope so. Thank you, Kerry. Love being on as always. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Good things. The uh, Gorsuch and um appointed to the Supreme Court, I give that an A plus. I, I can't think any any person could look at this guy and not say totally one thousand percent qualified to be on the Supreme Court. And I think most of the cabinet picks have been dead on good picks. Mm-hmm. And I think the president should be commended for all that. Right. I don't think that it's been great in the in the White House staff. I think the White House staff is frankly minor league. Uh, there's no heavyweight in there who really knows how government works and how the federal government especially works and can tell the president the things the president ought to hear, whether he likes them or not. Every president <laughs> needs to hear things that he may not want to hear, but he's got to hear it. And to have sycophants who just tell him what he wants to hear doesn't help any president. And they all all of them have these sycophants around them. I know. And they need they need a Jim Baker, a Leon Panetta, a sharp guy with experience who can say to the president, sir, with all due respect, this little tangent you're going on is a huge mistake. And I'm going to tell you why it's a mistake. And mm-hmm. invoke some history, some precedent to show yeah. that this particular thing, for instance, the tweet, the tweet about Obama bugged uh, Trump Tower has been a huge negative carry for this president. It has diverted attention from the White House, from the legislative effort, has sent congressional committees on a wild goose chase. I'm sure in his heart of hearts, Donald Trump, if he could take that back without having to admit he was wrong, would take it back because it hasn't helped him. It's hurt him. Mm -hmm. And he he shouldn't be tweeting at 624 on a Saturday morning without staff being involved. (laughs) And what a president says, and tweets and writes is hugely important. Every word that comes from a president carries the weight of gold with it and must be treated that way. And Trump's a little cavalier with that Twitter finger, you know, and lately he's yeah. been a little more careful about it because I think yeah. he no- knows that they got him into some trouble. Hey, when, when I met Trump, I did a couple of minor cases for him dealing with his casinos. That's always been my fear is that he's been surrounded with yes men. But uh, what I did notice is he, uh, what I thought I noticed during the campaign is that uh, he took guidance and, uh, and grew through the campaign. Because when one set of people wasn't working, they got replaced with a more effective set. And I think that's what you're going to see here, John, when he realizes it might take him a while to come to the conclusion that, hey, Reince Priebus, who I don't believe he could have gotten through the election without, because Priebus basically delivered Michigan, Ohio, and Wisconsin to him. Without him, he wouldn't have won. I'm convinced of it. So, but Priebus uh, is... FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. 
Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is March 29th, 2017. We're nine weeks in. What's the state of the Trump presidency? Here to discuss is former Congressman John Laboutlier. John, it's been a while. Welcome back. Kerry, it has, and it's been too long a while, and I'm happy to be back with you on your wonderful show. How are you? <laughs> uh, great. Everything is good, and uh, well, I don't know about the State of the Union, but it's definitely interesting, <laughs> isn't it? Oh, yeah. There's a lot going on. <laughs> One of the more active uh, first uh, nine weeks. Um, I'm going to say 100 days would be seven into 100 is like what? Uh, 14 and a half, call it. Weeks. Yeah, so we're... I think we're at 60, I don't know how many days we're in now. Um, Seems like forever. Nine weeks last Wednesday. So we're, we're coming up on 70 days. Yeah, 70 days. So 70% of the first 100 days. So, you know, <laughs> I, the topic that we could discuss would be, you know, taking a look at so far, where, where is Trump at? And I would say it's a mixed bag. You know, there's some, some very good. And staff would come in and tell him not to do something. He'd say to them, if you're so smart, how come I'm president and you're not? Wrong answer. Wrong, wrong answer. answer. And the wrong way of thinking. You should yeah. not be thinking that I'm smarter than my staff. No. Yeah, you're the boss. Surround yourself with people smarter than you is what you ought to do. That'll make you smarter. Yeah. Not surround yourself with ass kissers who tell you what you want to hear. Hey, the world's full of those, John. We know it. But hey, looking at yep. his cabinet picks, uh, some of them are downright inspired. I think uh, Kelly, General Kelly for Homeland. I think Mattis. I mean, they're doing more there. They appear to be. And then you go down to uh, Mnuchin. Seems to have a good grasp on things. Uh, these guys are, you know, they're go-getters. They, they know what they're doing. They appear to, to be in control. I mean, it remains to be seen. But they seem to be a cohesive group. And uh, Rex Tillerson, I mean, we haven't yep. had a secretary of state like him uh, since Baker. Uh, he seems to really be in charge, hits the ground running. And he cleaned house, cleaned out the seventh floor, uh, his third day in office, uh, the deep state there at the at State Department. I mean, that guy. So, yeah, your team... On the one hand, he makes these inspired picks in the cabinet. On the other hand, I think he feels indebted to these people. A lot of the staff that's around him is way out of his depth here as chief of staff. He's got to go. And uh, once that happens, and maybe he brings in Chris Christie and he's testing him out with his opioid abuse committee right now. I think it's a test run, but I think uh, he brings in the uh, adults and I think you'll you'll see it. A transition again take place. It's my guess. Well, it could be, could be. You're right because he did three times in four months change the campaign staff. He in June he got rid of Lewandowski and right. brought Manafort totally to run the whole thing. It already had Manafort above Lewandowski, but yep. Lewandowski was running it. Gets mm -hmm. rid of him, puts Manafort in charge till August, and he gets rid of Manafort. Brings in this triumvirate of Priebus, yeah. Bannon, and Kellyanne Conway. Yeah. And they took it all the way. And I, 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 he did listen, especially the last 10 days of the campaign where he went on the teleprompter, stopped with the off the cuff comments and stopped stepping all over his own message. Mm -hmm. And it worked. And he won. Now, as president, he's stepping all over his message all the time and he needs to tighten it up. I think. And, yeah. You know, we had this unfortunate quote to Time magazine the other day. Which is, I quote, I must be doing something all right because I'm president and you're not. Uh, it was an Obama that, that paraphrase. Is, that's an, yeah, it's a George H.W. <laughs> Bush phrase. Uh, the yeah. first Bush when yeah. he became president.